Good morning, everybody. My name is Grant Williams. I'm a portfolio and strategy advisor to Volpez Investment Management in Singapore and the author of a financial newsletter called Things That Make You Go Hmm. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about risk, which is a word you've no doubt heard an awful lot about in recent times, and for good reason, because the world is a very risky place right now for an investor. The odd thing is that, for reasons I will hopefully explain to you, the general perception is that there's very little risk out there. All kinds of markets, from equities to bonds, and even risk itself in the form of the VIX index, are priced as though 2008 never happened, and that all the problems are, to use a favourite phrase of the leaders of the European Union, behind us. I'm afraid I'm here to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. What do we actually mean by risk? Well, in life, it is, as the first definition you see here states, the potential that a given action or inaction will lead to an undesirable outcome. As far as investing is concerned, the latter definition covers it nicely. Investment risk is the risk that the return on an investment doesn't turn out to be what we expected. Historically, investors have been compensated for that risk through something called the risk premium, which in simple terms was the return above the risk-free rate that investors could expect to earn on a given investment in return for assuming the extra risk that that investment presented. What is the risk-free rate? Well, traditionally, it's always been taken as that offered by sovereign entities, generally U.S. Treasuries, and in particular the three-month Treasury bill. Now, since the events of 2008, this rate, which forms the bedrock of literally every single investment decision made anywhere in the world, has been utterly corrupted by the interventions and actions of a multitude of governments and central bankers across the globe. And that has led, in turn, to the corruption of just about every traditional price signal that investors such as myself use to assess risk and to make investment decisions. Today I'm hopefully going to show you just how this corruption and the resulting impurity of those price signals across multiple asset classes has made the world an incredibly dangerous place for investors and how recent events are transpiring to potentially send the price of one of the only true remaining safe haven assets considerably higher. But before we take a look at the world around us now, I want to take you all on a little journey back in time, back to a much happier, much simpler place. This was a time when the yield curve was an investor's friend, and a lifetime of prudent saving was justly rewarded. Ten-year treasuries paid you a 4.7% coupon each and every year, two years paid 4.8%, and a one-year CD would return to its holder 5.4%, essentially risk-free. Not only that, but this was a time when the CPI was 2.1%, and so investors enjoyed a phenomenon that long, long ago used to be called real interest rates and these were positive to the tune of all, about 3%. These were halcyon days. I believe it was 2007. It's a little over five years ago. Now, you remember that risk-free rate we spoke about a short time ago? Well, back in 2007, it was trading around 5%, which compares favourably with the average over the last 60 years, which stands at about 4.3, uh, 4.75%. Today, however, that rate looks nothing like it's ever done as three-month Treasury rates have been bumping along at essentially zero for the last four years, as you can see from this chart. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, let's imagine you've worked your whole life and long ago decided that $10 million was your number. When you hit that magical level, you would retire and live off the interest like all good millionaires do. In 2007, you could have invested your savings in those two-year Treasuries we mentioned and earned 4.8% per year, with essentially no risk whatsoever. That would have brought you a nice, fat income of $480,000 a year. Today, well, if you reach your magic number today and do the same thing, your income is going to be a little lower. In fact, it will be roughly $24,000, or 95% less, before tax. Now, make no mistake about it. This massive reduction in safe income is a very, very deliberate policy decision. It's called financial repression and it's here to stay, so you need to get used to it. But how on earth did we get to this ridiculous place? Well, in 2007, the world was buoyant, and asset prices, particularly US housing, were driven to extreme valuations through a binge on cheap credit fueled by Alan Greenspan and later Ben Bernanke and their lower for longer interest rate policy. But everywhere we looked, red lights were flashing, at least if you were willing to see them. Then came the Lehman bankruptcy, and it all came crashing down. Equity and bond markets the world over cratered, Gold fell to $700, safety was sought in cash and treasuries, and it became apparent, I think to everybody, that the world was never going to be the same again. And of course, by never, we meant about four years, as it turned out. Today, 
a little over 1,600 days after the largest corporate bankruptcy in history, far from being the financial wasteland that many feared the world would become, government and central bank intervention on an unprecedented and, pre-2008, unimaginable scale, has succeeded in avoiding the catastrophe we were all warned we would face had markets been left alone to sort out their problems. So far, at least, which is great. The S&P is within a whisper of its all-time high. The same goes for the German DAX index and the FTSE in London. And elsewhere in the investment universe, things are even more head-scratchingly obtuse. The quest for safety has sent investors careening into assets that had always previously been regarded as just that, safe. And that has historically and traditionally meant AAA-rated sovereign bonds. But, I'm afraid, safety ain't what it used to be. What those investors have failed to grasp is that after 2008, the vast majority of the risk has been transferred from private balance sheets to those of the taxpayer himself. So right now, piling into government bonds is like storing your possessions in the house next door when your own house is on fire. It's an incredibly foolish, incredibly dangerous thing to do. As investors have searched for the yield denied them by the stifling government intervention in the sovereign bond markets, they've been forced into places they normally wouldn't go anywhere near because of the high level of risk involved, places like junk bonds, for example. The yield on the Bank of America Merrill Lynch US High Yield Master II Benchmark Index recently sank below 6% for the first time since its launch in 1997. Amazingly, the yield on the BAML Corporate Triple B Index has reached 3.4%, again, its lowest ever. But perhaps the most worrying sign is the sheer complacency of markets so soon after 2008. Here we see the famous VIX index, which measures volatility in markets, and we find ourselves in the extraordinary position of being back to a place where we sat very comfortably in 2005 and 2006. You remember those days, you know, when there was definitely not a housing bubble and certainly not too much debt hanging over the world. Everything was contained. But is the world really as safe today as it seemed to us in 2005? Well, nowhere has the risk been graver than in Europe these past 12 months. As you can see from the quotes appearing here, Europe has been turning the corner for a little over three years now. I'm firmly on the record as having believed that 2012 would have seen the first country exit that misjudged union, but I was proven wrong, entirely by the tenacity with which the Eurocrats clung to their dream. Beginning with the denials that there was ever a problem with a currency union that clearly doesn't work in its present form, moving through the repeated assurances that the crisis was over, despite startling evidence to the contrary, and ending last July with Mario Draghi's assurance that he would do quote-unquote whatever it takes to defend the currency, the Eurocrats have lurched from one crisis to another, seemingly without a coherent plan except to fix each problem as it arises. But here we stand, a quarter of the way through 2013, and not only has Europe's crisis not gone away, it's on the verge of intensifying as the toxic cocktail of soaring unemployment in the southern states and little or negative growth in Europe's northern engine room combined with the intractability of a single currency and a suffocating debt load to make the risks in Europe potentially graver than at any time in the ongoing crisis, and the recent events in Cyprus bear testament to that. The numbers appearing here paint a dire picture of the world's largest consumer bloc. Unemployment in Greece is about 27%. Spain is in the same precarious condition. More than one in two of the under-25s in each of those countries are out of work, a situation that never ends well. Europe's budget deficit limit of 3% is little more than a joke, as you can see from the uh, procession of economies both weak and supposedly strong, which are missing that target handsomely. In fact, the average budget deficit of the 27 EU member nations is roughly 50% greater than the maximum limit allowed under the Maastricht Treaty. 2013 looks like bringing no relief to 2012's poor numbers, as the most recent IMF growth estimate for the EU demonstrates. Many countries within the European Union are on the verge of implosion. Take Spain, for example. Here is a country, the fourth largest in the Eurozone, the twelfth largest in the world, which is teetering on the edge of disaster. GDP is in freefall and shows absolutely no signs of slowing. As we mentioned, unemployment at 26% and 55% of under 25s is at levels higher than those in the USA during the Great Depression, and it's still climbing. And industrial production has been deeply negative for the last 12 months, and again, this too shows little or no sign of improving. And yet, amidst this dire picture of a country on the verge of collapse, the country's borrowing costs have been falling steadily for almost eight straight months. How's that possible? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. It's government intervention, period. This slide 
shows the reason that the perception of risk has fallen across the world. It's been shored up by taxpayer backstops that taxpayers neither understand nor would likely condone if they did. There are roughly 40 countries who currently either have zero or negative real interest rates. That's an utterly unprecedented situation. Five of the biggest central banks in the world are engaging in either covert, in the case of the ECB, or overt money printing, and a bunch of others are attempting to jawbone their currencies lower. Meanwhile, the world economy shows no real sign of any improvement. In fact, many of the previously strong economies, including everybody's favourite sugar daddy, Germany, are also beginning to slow. Government intervention has tragically become the lifeblood of markets and, therefore, the direct reason for many of today's upward moves across asset classes and the massive misperception of the level of risk, which leads us back to the corruption of those price signals we spoke about earlier. Here's how it works. Governments and central banks figure that all the problems facing the world today can be traced back to one thing and one thing only, a lack of confidence. Restore that confidence and you magically solve the world's problems. How? Well, because people will return to investing their money and growing the economy organically. Once that happens, the trillions in stimulus that's been injected can be very slowly withdrawn without allowing inflation to run wild. Simple. The way they've decided to go about doing that is to couple 0% interest rates with copious amounts of money printing, or to give it its euphemistic title, quantitative easing, and they firmly believe that if applied liberally enough and consistently enough, this magic formula will restore confidence. Once restored, that confidence leads, as surely as night follows day, to the magical missing ingredient. And that is growth. This is how they do it. The Fed and the Bank of England print money, then use that money to buy bonds, which in turn lowers their yields, and by extension lowers borrowing costs. The ECB, hamstrung by a difficult mandate and an obstinate Bundesbank that both forbid them from outright money printing, instead make loans to their member banks, who then turn around, buy the bonds, and again, lower yields and bring down borrowing costs. The Swiss National Bank, well, that's pegged its currency to the euro. So what it has to do is to uh, print Swiss francs in order to sell them for euros, in unlimited amounts, I might add, in order to defend that peg. Then, with those euros... You guessed it, they buy bonds, lower the yields, and bring down borrowing costs. Now, last to the party, but seemingly already a few sheets to the wind, is the Bank of Japan, who've now decided to print trillions of yen, which they will swap for dollars and euros, and they will then use that currency to buy safe sovereign bonds, lowering the yields, bring the borrow costs down, and on and on it goes. Isn't it clever? Well, yes, it is, except for one thing. Now, the world's central banks have all managed to expand their balance sheets by trillions of dollars and have accumulated portfolios of some of the poorest credits on the planet, establishing themselves as by far the biggest buyers in the sovereign bond markets. The central banks of the US, UK, ECB, Japan, Germany, France, China and Switzerland have between them tripled their collective balance sheets between May 2006 and October 2011. And since then, that buying spree has accelerated. So here's the vicious circle the banks have created through their seemingly pathological reluctance to allow market forces to exert themselves. When fear strikes markets, central banks and frightened investors step in and buy bonds, which leads to falling yields. This restores confidence, which negates the reason for holding bonds in the first place. So holders sell their bonds, in most cases back to the only remaining buyers, which is central banks, which causes yields to rise again and fear to return. And round and round it goes. Right now, We've reached the stage where all the cajoling and the assertions of folks such as Draghi, Van Rompuy and Barroso in Europe, and Bernanke and his fellow members of the FOMC in the US, have managed to instill a semblance of confidence once again. Unfortunately, that will cause them a huge problem, as investors sell their government bonds, which in a time of confidence and offering zero return, are terrible investments, and that will force interest rates higher and the fear to return. The explosion of debt issued by the world's governments in the last five years means the one thing they cannot afford to have happen is for interest rates to go higher, as it would make their debt impossible to service. This is a big problem, and that's essentially the corner that governments and central banks find themselves painted into. And after that rather lengthy lead-in, this is the part where we get to something many of you nice folks in this room really care about, and that's gold. For thousands of years, gold has been a true safe haven asset. Its price has gone up when safety has been required, such as during the Great Depression or the inflationary surge of the 70s and the debt fueled last decade that we've just witnessed. And its value has receded during periods when the general perception was that safety was no longer required, the 1980s and 90s being prime recent examples. Now, the reason gold has performed essentially as expected during each of those periods 
is that it's never been something that anybody, especially central banks, could conjure out of thin air. It has true intrinsic value. How safe is gold? Well, though they certainly couldn't be accused of not talking the talk, central bankers don't necessarily walk the walk. Witness this exchange between Congressman Ron Paul and Ben Bernanke from July 2011. Dr. Paul asks Bernanke whether gold is money. Bernanke replies that gold is categorically not money. When asked why central banks hold gold, Bernanke explains that holding it is simply a tradition for central banks. That's some tradition. Western central banks hold roughly three quarters of their wealth in something that is widely denounced as unproductive, and that is hardly a prudent thing to do for the most powerful bankers in the world, particularly as they attempt to force, or perhaps I should say persuade, investors that they should move out along the risk curve and invest their capital into risky assets to help restore growth. As you can see from this chart, many Western central banks, including a few surprising names like Greece and Portugal, hold a significant portion of their reserves in bullion. What is perhaps more surprising are the ones who don't. Of these, Switzerland, Turkey, India, Russia, Thailand, Mexico, China and South Korea have all been active and consistent buyers of gold since, in many cases, 2009. Japan and Canada, sadly, have yet to get the joke. So what do the banks do? How do they make this unproductive asset that's only held because of tradition work for them? Simple. They lease it out. The chart you can see appearing here is that of gold lease rates. These are the rates at which holders can lend gold into the market and, as you can clearly see, these rates fluctuate, which means there is an active lease market for gold, which undergoes ebbs and flows in supply and demand. It also confirms that, for much of the last decade, these rates have been, at best, a handful of basis points, making gold curiously cheap to borrow at a time when the price of other so-called good collateral, such as those AAA-rated government bonds, were at levels not seen in some cases in 400 years. And for long periods of time, these bond rates have actually been negative. The usual reason for low prices? Well, traditionally, it's increased supply. It's also worth noting that in 2008, when fear was the highest it had been in almost 80 years since the Great Depression, gold lease rates climbed no higher than about a third of the levels they reached during the fear over the dreaded millennium bug. Anyway, these words, spoken by Alan Greenspan before a Senate committee in 1998, have been seen as a smoking gun of sorts by many gold watchers in the years since they came to light. Central banks, said Greenspan, stand ready to lease gold in increasing quantities should the price rise. Well, as you can see from this chart overlay, the price has been steadily rising for over a decade now, so one can only extrapolate from what Greenspan said. Now, for years, this practice of central bank gold leasing has been a secretive, shadowy operation that's rarely spoken about in polite company when those involved in it get together at cocktail parties. At least, that was the case until the Austrian central bank, holder of the world's 22nd largest bullion stash, released a statement recently, actually in November 2012, that caused a few raised eyebrows, to say the least. They, uh, they publicised the fact that over the last 10 years they'd made a profit of $300 million for the Austrian taxpayer through leasing out their gold. Now, €300 million Euro over 10 years sounds like a pretty decent windfall for Austrian taxpayers. If we work those numbers backwards, it's possible to estimate that Austria has leased 84 tonnes, or 30% of its gold, into the market. Now, just hold that thought for a second, folks. Before we go any further, I wanted to pause for a second and take a quick look at something called fractional reserve banking, which is going to be important for the rest of this discussion, and frankly, I couldn't think of a clever way of working it gently into the conversation. Now, many of you will understand exactly what this is and how it works, but for those that don't, allow me to try and quickly explain the mechanics of the banking system under which every one of us currently operates, whether we realise it or not. Fractional reserve banking is a clever little construct that began long before central banks roamed the earth, when it dawned on bankers that, generally speaking, depositors tend not to all withdraw their deposits at the same time. This meant that those bankers could lend out their deposits many times over as long as they kept enough in reserve to be able to satisfy the withdrawal request they would receive in the normal course of business, which is great, as long as their depositors don't all want their money back at the same time. By way of an example of how fractional reserve banking works, let's create a world in which 10% of deposits are required to be kept as reserves. 
This means that for every $100 deposited, the bank is required to reserve $10 against potential withdrawals, but can then lend out another $90 to its customers. Now, our $100 has magically turned into $190. The original $100 still exists, but that additional $90 created out of thin air by the bank can then be redeposited, and another 10% of the $90 is reserved, leaving an additional $81 of magic money to once again be lent out to the bank's customers. And round and round it goes, until we reach the point where, for every $100 of real money deposited, the bank has lent out an additional $900. This system works beautifully, right up until the point when it doesn't. When confidence fails, people tend to want their money back, all at once. And that's when we get a bank run. And that is the tiny little flaw in fractional reserve banking. And we're back. So, we've discussed how Western central banks hold upwards of 70% of their reserves, in many cases, in gold bullion. We've seen how gold lease rates fluctuate, and now we've looked at how fractional reserve banking works. So it's not exactly a stretch to figure out where we're going with this next. Yes, folks, fractional reserve gold. Holding 70% of your reserves in an asset that earns no interest is hardly anybody's idea of prudence, especially when you've got bills to pay. And so central banks engage in leasing programs to the so-called bullion banks. The bullion banks borrow gold from the central banks at essentially no charge. Current 12-month lease rates uh, are just 34 basis points, and they sell it into the market. This suits both parties perfectly. As the gold is only leased out, the central banks can still carry it on their balance sheets as an asset, whilst the bullion banks use the cash from their sales to buy higher yielding securities, such as, oh, I don't know, let's pick something at random. How about Greek bonds? In today's wonderful backstop world, worthless one-year Greek bonds, the sovereign debt of a bankrupt nation, pay 9% interest. That's a nice free profit of $86,600 per $1 million leased for the bullion banks. Or, if we use our friends in Austria as an example, the 84 tons of gold they leased out would, over the course of the last year alone, while Europe teetered on the brink of collapse, have made someone a profit of $435 million. That's not bad compared to the 300 million euros the Austrian central bank made over a 10-year period. If we take a conservative average rate of return of 5% on the assets the gold leases reinvested instead of that 9% return on the Greek bonds, and we look at that 10-year period, we get a $2.34 billion profit for those bullion banks. And that's just 30% of the gold of one central bank, the 22nd biggest central bank in the world. Now, I said it suits both parties perfectly, but thus far it seems a pretty one-sided arrangement. So let's take a little look at what the central banks get out of this deal. As we've seen, the bullion banks are carving out a nice juicy profit from their participation in the gold leasing trade. But what's in it for the central banks? After all, they could eat into that fat margin and share the spoils a little more fairly, quite easily one would imagine. Well, a rising gold price is a sure sign of both inflationary pressure in an economy as well as a growing distrust of fiat currency, and neither of those is something that governments are too happy about. So it suits them that the price of gold be under control and not get too crazy too quickly. Governments tend to like things being orderly for obvious reasons. If they have to give up a little juice to keep a lid on things, then so be it. It's a fair trade for them. Leasing their gold, safe in the knowledge that, with those huge margins, it will most definitely find its way into the marketplace in order to generate sizable returns for the bullion banks, is a great way for governments and central banks to keep a lid of sorts on the price. In so doing, they are technically not losing control of the asset as it still sits on the right side of their balance sheet. And by that I mean it sits on the left side of their balance sheet. And they can technically call it back at any time from the bullion bank to whom they loaned it. What could possibly go wrong? Well, between them, the 60 member central banks of the Bank for International Settlements, who all get together every couple of months in Switzerland, own 25,901 tonnes of gold. And as William R. White, the former head of the BIS Monetary and Economic Department, so kindly explains, they collaborate to influence gold prices in circumstances where this might be thought useful. If we use the example of our friends in Austria, who happen to be a member of the BIS, and work on the basis that the other members also lease 30% of their gold, that creates 7,770 tonnes of gold 
that can be potentially leased into the market. Now, that number may be high, but Austria doesn't have their own currency to try and keep under control, so I suspect it may be low, but either way, let's go with it all the same. Now, if we apply the mechanics of fractional reserve lending, and rather than use nine times reserves, like we saw in our banking example, use a far more conservative five times, that gives us 38,850 tonnes of gold that could potentially be sold into the marketplace. Again, it's important to remember that once that leased gold has been loaned into the marketplace, it can be sold on or rehypothecated essentially an infinite number of times. As long as there's no need to get the original gold back for delivery, there isn't a problem, just like in fractional reserve lending. As you can see from this chart, we're talking about a lot of gold here. It's roughly five times the total held by the USA, or over twice the entire holdings of the US and the EU combined. Now, the last time the gold price got out of control, you guessed it, it was the late 1970s and early 1980s, when, quite coincidentally of course, inflation got out of control too. Paul Volcker found himself playing catch-up with interest rates and had no choice but to hike them from 4 and three quarter percent to 15.5%, which is unimaginable in this day and age. By the time he'd broken the back of the inflationary spiral the US found itself in, gold had quadrupled in price. As you can see from these charts, there was a very clear tipping point, and it's notable for a couple of reasons. Firstly, prior to that point, it had looked for all the world as though inflation was under control. CPI fell from 10% to 6% and looked to be heading lower, but then it suddenly turned right around and doubled. Secondly, despite the resurgence of inflation, the Fed bumped interest rates up, but then left them unchanged for nine months as things began to slip out of their control. After falling steadily, if unspectacularly, gold began to climb just before the tipping point, and from there it just kept going higher. If we now overlay the current bull market in gold, the parallels to the 70s are pretty eerie, right down to the shape of the recent consolidation phase after the move in 2011 to 1900. Oh, one thing that was different back in the 1970s, US debt to GDP, which stood at 25%. So, using the fractional reserve example, we can see how it pertains to the gold market. Gold sold into the market that has been leased is callable by the lender, so effectively the bank selling the initial position has borrowed it and sold it short. What this means, as the gold makes its way through the system, is that the number of claims on that single bar of gold increases every time a sale is effected. Such is the nature of fractional reserve lending. This system has been working very well for several decades now. The central banks have received a small return on their largest reserves, and the bullion banks have been selling that gold into the market several times over, which has helped suppress the price and keep the true level of devaluation of the dollar hidden from view. Spread the bullion over a number of bullion banks, all eager to make a profit, and you've got yourself a structure that suits just about everybody involved, with the notable exception of any buyers of physical gold who end up with phantom claims, of course. But that's yet to play itself out yet. Now behind me is a short list of national institutions along with the amount of gold they're purported to own. I say purported because if we take a look at the specific line items on each of their balance sheets we see a little murkiness emerge in places. Japan and the IMF keep things nice and simple but the others all have vagaries in their language that suggests all is not as perhaps it should be. How much gold do these institutions hold? The simple truth is we really don't know for sure. However, just like the fractional reserve banking system, everything works very well indeed. Or at least, it has been. On August the 14th, 2011, fractional reserve lending in the gold market, the cosy little game that the central banks and bullion banks have been playing for decades, came to an end. Only nobody really noticed. Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez, demanded that 99 tonnes of gold held on his country's behalf at the Bank of England be repatriated so it could sit beneath the Venezuelan central bank nice and safe. Unlike Chavez himself, Venezuelan gold was a long way from crackers. 99 tonnes of gold is hardly an earth-shattering amount. It's a little under half of what Barrick Gold pulled out the ground in 2011. So why all the fuss? Well, it goes back to that quaint idea of fractional reserve lending. As soon as Chavez demanded his gold back, he pulled on a thread which has the potential to unravel the entire gold leasing structure and send the price of gold through the roof. Chavez's request was reported as the ramblings of a madman, and largely ignored, particularly by the mainstream media. But a funny thing happened in the wake of his request. After Chavez repatriated his gold in August of 2011, it became a question of who would blink first. It was clear that central banks would want to start reclaiming their gold and holding it onshore, rather than leave it stacked in the vaults of the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. After all, if you know that a decent amount of the gold in those vaults has been leased out, 
Why on earth would you take the chance that you're the last guy to ask for his back? After Chavez set the precedent, very quietly a few fringe countries began following suit. First up were, of course, the Swiss. Four members of parliament tabled a petition to repatriate Switzerland's gold. Now, once that has 100,000 signatures, a referendum, a national referendum, has to be called under Swiss law. And that milestone was passed last week, so we wait to see the details of that referendum. Next up was little Ecuador, who decided they'd rather have a third of their 26 tonnes of gold at home in Quito rather than store it in a foreign bank. Ecuador was followed by Austria. Then in quick succession, the Netherlands and Azerbaijan decided they'd better get cracking. But none of these caused a stir like that which erupted on January the 14th of this year, when the Bundesbank joined the party. Germany announced that they would bring home all the gold stored under the Banque de France in Paris, which is currently 11% of their gold, or 373 tonnes. And more importantly, 300 tonnes of gold will be repatriated from New York. When it was announced uh, several days later that those 300 tonnes would take approximately seven years to bring home to Germany, a gallon of gasoline was poured on an already raging fire. But as telling as this move was, and unusually for a European nation of late, you really had to pay attention to what they said, not what they did. A couple of months earlier, in November 2012, Andreas Dobrit of the Bundesbank made the following remarks concerning what he called irrational fears over Germany's gold held overseas. Dobrit assured those in attendance at his speech in New York that not only were fears over the safety of Germany's overseas gold reserves quote-unquote irrational, but the Bundesbank would remain trusted partners with the Fed. Now, I'm not sure what happened during that six-week period, but I can only guess something did, because the Bundesbank suddenly decided that perhaps they would bring a chunk of their gold home anyway, just in case everything was fine and nothing ever happened. After all, you can't be too careful. Chavez's repatriation demand threatens to unwind the entire gold leasing system as his crazy request starts to gain traction amongst the more cautious central banks around the world. To illustrate how this might happen, let's place 1,000 tonnes of gold safely in a central bank vault. Now, we will apply the leasing metrics used by our friends in Austria and we'll loan out 30% of that gold, or 300 tonnes, to our friends at the bullion banks. So far, so good. There are 700 tonnes in the vault and the other 300 tonnes can be called back at any time. If we throw into the mix the 34 basis points in interest we're earning, then everything is pretty peachy in central bank land. Now, let's say, for argument's sake, a crazy South American head of state asked to have his portion of the gold repatriated because, I don't know, he wants to make his palace look more like Donald Trump's apartment. He sends a request for his 20 tonnes of gold and in due course takes delivery, no problem. But now another crazy backwards government decides that maybe it's not such a bad idea to have their gold where they can see it, so they ask for their 30 tonnes back. No biggie. Now a slightly less crazy nation decides it may as well have its 50 tonnes back, followed in short order by two more who want 70 and 80 tonnes back respectively. Now it's not ideal, but there's still plenty of gold in the vault to cover withdrawal requests. Until a big country, I don't know, one who had previously affirmed its commitment to the status quo, has a rather bizarre change of heart and demands, I don't know, let's pick a number out of thin air. What do you say? 350 tonnes. Now, you have 100 tonnes in the vault and you have outstanding claims on 400 tonnes. You have something of a panic on your hands. In short, you have a rather nasty problem. The failure by any single bank to return any amount of leased gold will most likely result in cash settlement being forced upon the ultimate owner of the asset. And that is not what anybody has in mind when switching a proportion of their assets into gold bullion. Such a chain of events would send shockwaves through the entire banking system and trigger a rush to perfect monetary assets that just aren't there. What price an ounce of readily delivered gold then, I wonder? None of the systemic problems that caused the crisis of 2008 have been properly addressed. Public sector backstops and staggering additional levels of debt have been plastered over the cracks in the hopes that they will bind the world together long enough for growth to return. But in providing those backstops and assuming that additional debt, the world's central banks have put themselves in a very precarious position. The list of things that can go wrong is daunting, and at this point, even the tiniest misjudgment on their behalf is likely to have catastrophic consequences. A collapse in confidence, a surge in inflation, huge social and political unrest, a global recession, a breakup of the EU, a series of sovereign defaults or a worldwide currency war are at this point all very, very possible outcomes. Any one of them could trigger a collapse. In each case, the value of gold as a safe haven and as a store of value will increase enormously. So what's it to be? 
Do we get the famous Goldilocks ending to this fairy tale? Yes, equity markets are near their all-time highs, but those are purely nominal highs. And yes, bond markets are at levels never before seen in modern history. Yes, the euro is still not only a viable medium of exchange, but somehow also a relatively strong one. And the European Union has somehow survived 2012 intact, although the events in Cyprus suggest that that may not continue for much longer. And yes, gold has seemingly lost its upward momentum that's carried it through the previous decade. Inflation is contained, confidence is returning, and the worst is over, and has been for three years now, according to the Eurocrats. Perhaps most importantly, the Fed, the same people who saw neither the Nasdaq bubble nor the housing bubble before they burst, have assured us they have an exit strategy. All of this seems to suggest that we are through the storm and are set for calm seas, and wouldn't that be wonderful? But this case is based largely on projections of, frankly, a very unreliable group of people with an appalling track record in such matters. The alternative scenario is based largely on real numbers and a realistic appraisal of the current state of the world. The worst is most definitely not over. The seemingly never-ending injection of monetary stimulus from central banks will, at some point, show up as inflation, no matter how many levers are pulled by the BLS in dreaming up the CPI. The bond market will, at some point, wake up and realise the true creditworthiness of supposedly AAA-rated countries, and the currency skirmishes that are smouldering, despite recent G7 and G20 uh, assertions to the contrary, could flare up into a fully-fledged currency war. The unemployment situation in the Mediterranean countries could, as the summer heats up, turn into something disastrous. The ongoing events in Tunisia and Egypt prove that the Arab Spring is not only not over, but has the potential to destabilise the Middle East once again, and perish the thought but one of these days, somebody is going to ask for their gold back and be told they can't have it. In this scenario, in all of these scenarios, the value of gold is going a lot higher. There's one other possibility that I put at the, at the top of the slide, incidentally, when I put it together a couple of weeks ago, and it was this one. Yes, Cyprus, Spain and Greece do all have the potential to shatter the fragile calm in Europe, and that's been borne out by the events of this weekend, events which demonstrate the problems that occur when there's any kind of rush to secure assets. So, Little Cyprus, an island nation whose 18 billion euro GDP equates to just 0.2% of the eurozone total, looks to be potentially the location of the worst policy mistake and, mis and political misjudgment we've seen in Europe since someone told Maginot to go ahead and build that line. Last week's bail-in, a pathetic attempt to conjure up a euphemism for having your money stolen by the government, has the potential to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And what happens next is really anybody's guess. But if we look at the numbers, they're quite revealing. The Cypriot banking system is 150 billion euros, give or take, and of that, deposits total 72 billion, which is a pretty decent number. The problem lies in the non-resident deposits, which are roughly 38 billion euros. And of that, roughly 31 billion is money from Russia. All this on top of a GDP of only 18 billion. The problem lies in those uh, non-resident deposits, which have no reason to stay in Cyprus now. So once they're able to, those deposits are going to flee in a hurry. And that's going to cause what everybody's afraid of from the get-go, a bank run. So, despite the almost rabid assurances that things are getting better, please, please be careful and try to accurately assess the risks of investing in today's environment. Do not listen to forecasts and projections from people who've been horribly wrong about everything they've been predicting for years. Pay even less attention to the people who couldn't see the housing bubble for what it was, or those who said everything was contained when they tell you they have it under control. It wasn't, it isn't, and they really don't. The risk is very, very real, and it's grossly underestimated. But above all, own some physical gold that has no claims on it from anybody else. One day, I suspect quite soon, you'll be very, very glad you did. Thank you very much for listening.